Our Father in heaven, we're asking that you join us here by your spirit, that you would be our teacher and our parent, and we ask for that gift in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's time now for our opening hymn. It's number 579, Tis Love That Makes Us Happy. Please be
those who saved are his delight. Christ will hold him fast, precious in his holy side. He will hold me fast, he'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last, precious in His holy sight. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. has been satisfied he will hold me fast raised with him to endless life his promises shall last till our faith has turned to sight when he comes at last Our scripture this morning is from 1 Thessalonians 5, and it starts in verse 9 and goes through 14. So 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, or to punishment, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort or beseech yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, and that means someone that's a soldier that's fallen out of ranks, Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. I turn the time now over to Eugene. First, I should introduce him. Some of you were here last night, but uh, he and his wife Heidi are missionaries in Asia, uh, most recently in Malaysia, and they are starting a program, a school in Bangladesh as well, and. I've known him through his years of teaching the deep Bible study class at Young Disciple Camp, and I've appreciated his instruction guiding our children, and I, I feel blessed to have him 
here to present on mental health to us. So let's turn the time over to him. I was walking up my mountain there in Malaysia when I saw, well, first I heard. I heard the mountain dogs making the excited bark. You know you have dogs. You're in the part of the United States where almost everyone has a dog. It, the bark that says, I'm hungry, I'm happy, I'm excited, that bark. And as I came around the corner, I saw the six dogs were surrounding a banana tree. Dogs don't eat bananas. And, uh, I mean, your dog might, but that's because you made him do it. But these dogs were not interested in bananas. They saw on top of that banana tree, there was a mother monkey and her little baby, and there was nowhere nearby for her to jump. There was no tree to go to, and they knew she couldn't get away, and so they were so happy. If you ever want to see this, the picture in your mind of this more accurately, if you're a phone addict, you could type in dusky leaf langer, and you'd see that these are kind of brownish, dark brownish monkeys that have white eyebrows and kind of like a white mustache, and uh, very cute looking monkeys, these ones. And as I watched, I saw the most amazing thing. I saw the mother monkey take her baby off herself and put him there on the top of the banana tree. And she turned and she jumped over one of the dogs and led all six of them away on a chase. And that baby monkey climbed down, went to a jungle tree, and climbed up to safety. It's the most amazing thing. But I thought about it that that baby monkey, how did he know to get down? How did he know to get moving? You know, if he had stayed there, don't you think the dogs would come back? Don't you think? And if they did, there'd be no way that baby could escape. Uh, I'm saying this to you because I think, and I, I'm conscious some of you are watching this on uh, Zoom or however you do your streaming here, uh, I think many of us, we know that Jesus has already jumped over the dogs. We know he's done that. We, we, it was in our scripture today that he died for us. We know that. And we're just sitting there on the top of the tree. And I would say to you, first thing today, get down and go to the jungle and climb to safety don't waste what Jesus has done for you. One more story and then a Bible study. Uh, I have been stuck in this country for a year and five months. And I don't know how you can stand it. <laughs> and uh, this, this place where there is so much light available and so little appreciation of it, and, uh, but while I was here, I got the idea that I shouldn't do nothing, and I began trying to leverage Facebook for something that wouldn't waste my life. And I used it to contact people in countries where we don't really have a work. She listened to the children's story so well, or he, I, I shouldn't ask that right now, but anyway, uh, I decided to contact people in Saudi Arabia and Somalia and in Bhutan and in several other countries. And I want to tell you about one of them. His name is Musab. Musab lives in uh, Hergeiza. Hergeiza is in the western part of Somalia. He is not likely to ever meet a Christian in his life unless I fly there to say hi to him. Not likely to ever encounter one. And uh, he lives in one of the most fanatically Islamic parts of the planet. He told me that if anyone finds out, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, 
I began writing to him about a year and two months ago. And when I did, he would have liked to have converted me to Islam. But we began sharing. We started talking about COVID, you know, how to recover from COVID. Because a lot of people in that part of the world don't have money to get treated. They can't get oxygen containers. And I mean, what we do here is we give them oxygen and special care. And, and we don't have a lot more we can do right here, except some machines to help you breathe while you recover your lung capacity. Well, none of that's available there. So we were talking about what to do. And eventually I got him to read some studies on Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8. And I sent him this book, Ministry of Healing. And I remember about five months ago, he sent me a picture with him with a statement from the Quran and a statement from Ministry of Healing. And he said, they're both holy books and they don't agree. Well, he's a thinking man. And he told me near the beginning of our friendship that he prays to God every single day that God will please guide him in the right way. Please lead him to what is true. He doesn't want to be wrong and to be mistaken. Every day he prays. I'd say he has a love of the truth. I'm not sure everyone in this country that has the truth has a love of the truth. The fact that you have the truth is not proof that you have a love of the truth. Those are different things. But Musab, he had a love of the truth when he didn't have the truth. And he was asking, well, I just want to tell you that about, well, was it YD? So how many weeks ago was that? Is that seven, eight, something like that? Anyway, at YD, Facebook reminded me that it was my one-year friendiversary with, Mus with Musab, uh, that we had been corresponding for a year. And I thought, you know, it's about time. We've been studying together. He's learned a lot. I've answered his questions. And what was really scaring him all the way is that if he leaves Islam and it's right, it's the unpardonable sin. You know, it's, it's a one-way ticket to eternal hell. If Islam is right and he leaves it, that is scary business. But if it's wrong, and he, I remember writing to me, he wrote me once and said, will God be angry at me for searching? I said, Musab, truth looks more true the more you check into it. An error looks more erroneous the more you check into it. God, more than anyone in the universe, wants people to search. He wants them to look. If Islam is true, the more you search, the more you'll see it. If it's false, the sooner you see it, the better. So anyway, we had had the conversations aplenty. Like my messenger conversation with Musab would make a book. And uh, so on the, our friend anniversary, I wrote to him and said, listen, brother, it's about time that you make a decision. If Islam is right, there's no sense playing games any longer. If Jesus is the savior of all mankind and Islam is wrong, there's no sense being a Muslim any longer. I, I need you to spend some time and study. I'll support you in that time while you study and look through and make a conclusion. And he said, I will. And two weeks later, he let me know he's decided to follow Jesus. Uh, Musab is a Christian today, and he's never met one. He's learning about the truth. He's excited to know that hell doesn't last forever. He's excited to know, but he wants to tell his parents because he loves his parents. But if he tells them and they reject it, he could die. So it's just a real difficult time for him. Do you think you'd want to tell your parents? if you knew the way to heaven. So you can pray for Musab and pray for his parents. Pray that God will give them a heart such that even if they don't accept, that they won't be vindictive or revengeful. Vengeful, I guess, is the word.
Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, just before Revelation. We're talking today about love, but it's going to take us a while to get there. But I'll tell you that when a Muslim leaves Islam and becomes an Adventist, <clears throat> the thing that impresses him most about God is love. The thing that impresses her the most is God's love. The thing that really grabs them, and sometimes they're convicted by things that maybe we read them and it just goes over our head or off our back like water on a duck. I'll keep your Bible open, but I want, I want to mention Sajjad to you. Sajjad lives 90 minutes south of Baghdad. He became a Christian after I studied with him for just a few days. He has read Patriarchs and Prophets and Prophets and Kings and is working now in Desire of Ages and is just amazed by all of these books. But when he was reading Patriarchs and Prophets, I remember the day he wrote me. I think it's probably the day he was born again. He wrote me about the story of Eve and her fall. He said he had never understood before how terrible a small sin is. But now he can see he doesn't want to do small sins anymore. Did you ever see that in that story? How terrible a small sin is. Are you in Jude? Verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Uh, verse 5 is such an interesting picture, so, so compact. It says that God worked miracles and led some people out of the false Babylonian Egyptian idol worship place. He led them out as a group of commandment keepers. And what happened to that group that was miraculously pulled out? What happened to them according to this verse? Well, that same group that left Egypt by miracle died in the wilderness almost by miracle. I mean, there had to be some supernatural activity in it because it was all of them except two, and the two were the ones God said wouldn't die. So it just wasn't natural occurrences going on there. And the verse says it too. It says he destroyed them. Do you see that in the end of the verse? The same ones that he saved, he destroyed. Now, that, if you follow that verse and you've had a most amazing experience with God in the past, that verse should give you quite a bit of, of self, uh, like you should be considering that maybe it means you. If you read that verse and it doesn't even seem like it could mean you at all, then I think that you're a hardened individual. And I, I fear for you. But it, it ought to make us think, that verse. What's interesting to me in that verse is that most of us probably knew the facts of that verse before we read it. But those facts didn't really affect us until we read them. It was when we were thinking about the ideas that they began to create some somber musings, some thinking. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brothers, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. Verse 1 tells you that Paul was a successful preacher. I, was a, I don't follow many people on Facebook, about four, to be honest with you. But one of them is Dave Fiedler. And uh, because he puts out material that is useful to me. So I read it. And uh, recently he, he put out something 
about how, you know, some people say defund the police. Well, what Dave was saying is, how about we defund all ministries that aren't accomplishing anything? You know, defund the ministries that take in this much money and get this much done, and use the money to fund the ministries that take this much money and get this much done. Uh, the idea of evaluating ministries on the basis of their productivity. Uh, I like the idea. And if you evaluate preachers like that, there's a lot of them going to be defunded. Right? But not Paul. Do you see here in this verse that he had some success? He said, I preached the gospel. And what happened after he preached it to the heathens? They accepted it. And how about down the road a bit? How are they still doing with it according to verse 1? They're standing. So it's going okay for them. So I'd say give Paul credit. He's a successful preacher. Talking to pagan people, raising up churches that are still stable. Look at verse 2. So interesting. By which also you are saved, if you keep in mind what I preached unto you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. I just changed that verse to how I understand it. If you wonder why it doesn't track with what you just read. Uh, what Paul said is that the gospel can save you, but not without your attention. It's not unless you, unless it's in your face. This is why in the Old Testament, they killed lambs so often. Not because God likes blood and bloody messes and, and it, it's very unpleasant for God to see an uh, innocent animal die. If it, if it turns your stomach, his more. But what was important is that the people not forget for days, certainly not weeks or months, that they are dependent on a Savior to take their place and die for them. That was important. While you're thinking about the cross, it has a power for you. But if you're not thinking about it, the fact that you would get the answers right on a quiz does not empower the truth. The truth affects you when you think about it. So Jesus prayed. John 17 is his famous prayer. You can turn there, but I'm not going to turn there. I'm just reminding you of something you know in it. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But it's possible right here in Kashmir, and I'll finish the sentence and then say something about Kashmir. It's possible right here in Kashmir that there are people who have been coming to church here for decades and are still addicted to pornography. People who've been coming here for a long time and still have out-of-control anger issues. It's still possible that people have been coming here for a long time and are still not honest in business deal. I guess what I'm saying is, it's possible that you can believe the truth a long time without being sanctified. Would you agree at least with the last sentence? When Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth, he didn't mean that the truth does it automatically. What I'm telling you is the truth doesn't do it automatically. It does it by that principle that by beholding we become changed. It does it by having our attention. So when we think about it, it's powerful. When we don't think about it, it's powerless. The devil knows that. And he has set up a plan to really destroy us, and it doesn't require complicated conspiratorial elements. All he has to do is keep us distracted from the truth. That's what he has to do. I think that the reason that I am who I am today is largely because that when I was 11, someone taught me this idea. They taught me that Satan was going to use television to destroy the faithful. 
And so when I was 11, I stopped watching television. I turned away from it in heart. My parents thought it was fanatical. My brother thought it was fanatical. But it made a difference for me. When I began giving the truth attention, it began to make a change. When I didn't give it attention, it didn't have prior to that experience of giving the truth significant attention, it never had done a lot for me. So I'm here to talk to you about mental health, and let me explain or get to that right now. One of the most significant parts of your mind is your imagination. Your imagination is a tool that God gave that was part of the system that makes you in the image of God. That is, God has creativity, and he's given you imagination. It is a microcosm, or a, it's related to his ability, but it's not his ability. But he gave you your imagination as a, a tool. I, you know, I have a home in Tennessee that I'm using to support myself by Airbnb. We have pretty strict Sabbath rules for that home. And uh, uh, we had a garage sale, a yard sale really, a few weeks ago to get rid of things. And a man came and he didn't want anything that I was selling. He said, do you have any tools? Well, I do, but guys sell tools. They like to buy them. But anyway, he persuaded me, and I took him out to my shed. And in the shed, he found a tool. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it seems to me it must be some major clamp. But it's a, a long iron rod with ridges with a, what looks like a, a wrench end about this big on one end and on the other end. It looks like it might be something related to, I, don't, I really don't know what it is, but it's heavy. You know, like maybe like 35, 40 pounds of steel. He said, will you sell this? I said, yes. <laughs> In fact, since for sure I'll never use it since I don't have any clue what it's for. And, uh, and I did sell it. I think it probably was a very useful tool. It looks like you even know what it is. Maybe both of you know what it looks <laughs> like. Don't tell me how much it was worth because I'm sure he got a good deal on it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> If you don't know how to use a tool, that tool will just sit there in your shed forever and won't be worth anything. It might be worth something to these men, but it wasn't worth anything to me. What's this tool of the imagination for? This tool of the imagination was given to allow you to be sanctified in the midst of moral corruption. It was given so you could be sanctified when all around you is iniquity. So when you're in prison and all around you is evil talk and evil action, you can be sanctified because with your imagination, you can picture the story of the cross. You can picture the judgment going on up in heaven. You can picture the soon coming of Jesus. You can picture the creation of the world. Your imagination allows you to inherit from Abraham in a similar manner to how you inherited from your dad. I mean, from your dad, sure, you inherited some things genetically or epigenetically, but you also got a lot from your dad by watching. A lot of what you got was by paying attention. What you saw there affected you a great deal. And just as watching your dad affected you in, since you're on earth, it probably wasn't a great way, but watching Abraham will affect you in a different way. You can be a child of Abraham with your imagination. This, is the, this was the tool God gave us so that we could be sanctified. And Satan, knowing that, and that the last age of the earth is a special time for purifying God's people, Satan has worked tirelessly to disease the imagination. If you were to go into Ellen White's writings and search this phrase, disease asterisk imagine asterisk, where you'd find all, you would find hundreds and hundreds of references to diseases of the imagination. And as I've studied these this year, and I have studied them a lot this year, 
I know that we call some of those diseases bipolar disorder. Some of them we call schizophrenia. Some of them we call ADHD. Some of them we call obsessive compulsive disorder. Some of them we call, but well, we have a lot of names for these, but what heaven calls them, many of them are diseases of the imagination. And what's going on here is that the mind, instead of you being in charge of your mind, your mind has become, your will has become passive in relation, relation to your imagination. And your imagination, even right now while I talk to you, you might be thinking about something completely unrelated to what I'm saying. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. I don't mind if you stay, sir. Second Peter, chapter 1, looking at verse 12. Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Do you see there that Peter feels like he has an ongoing obligation. Do you see it in the first part of that verse? <clears throat> like if he doesn't carry it on, it's negligence. Because of methamphetamine, a lot of parents are becoming negligent in this country. Uh, there, are, there are mothers who aren't changing their baby's diapers and aren't feeding them because of their meth addictions. And... Uh, when you see that, you pity the baby, and you might even pity the mother and her addiction. You know it must be a powerful addiction that does that to her. But Peter, he feels like he has a duty to you like that mother has to her baby. He has a duty. He says, to put you in remembrance of these things, though you what? Though you know them and be what? Are you not looking in your Bible? Uh, established. And those of you who are watching on Zoom, even though you're hungry, don't eat yet. You should be also using your Bibles. Look it up. It says established in the present truth. Peter said, the fact that you know it does not get me off the hook to tell you again and again. And you might say, Peter, that doesn't make any sense at all. If we already know it, why do you need to tell us again and again? Look at verse... 13. Yes, I think it is appropriate, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Oh, what does the remembrance do in this verse? It gets you going. It stirs you up. It affects you. You knew it before. You knew yesterday that Jesus is coming soon, but you weren't thinking about it, and it did not affect the way you did your business. Right now, if we talk about it, you're thinking about it, and if there's something to do, it might affect how you do it. That's the nature of truth. So Peter said, we preachers need to stir up ye people. We need to be stirring them up by telling them over and over. So I think we're in the state of Washington, aren't we? You had a man here that died a number of years ago named Ron Spear. Did he ever speak in this church? Ron Spear was an evangelist that retired himself from working as an evangelist to start a magazine. And the reason he did it was because he felt like that the church's publications had lost their, their, their mission of reminding people about the things they need to hear about over and over and over so Ron did something that made no sense in a business publication sense. He started a magazine that every issue was on the same stuff. It was every issue was on the Sabbath and on the sanctuary and on the spirit of prophecy and on the state of man and death and on the health message. Every issue for month after month after month, year after year after year, never ending, same topic over and over. Do you know within a few years... Ron had more paid subscribers than the Review and Herald. Why? It's not because he had the best writers in the world. It's because 
somehow, spiritually, we know when we hear the truth, we needed that. And when we don't really hear it, we know we're hungry. And what he was doing was providing food in due season. And when people would get it, they would feel like they got something. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you all grew up as Adventists, but probably some of you didn't. Frequently, when people become Adventists, they say something like, I learned more in that prophecy series than I learned going to church for 30 years. You ever heard anyone talk like that? It's the nature of what happens when you get fed, when you feel like you're gaining something. Well, I've already lost some people because it's past noon, but I'm going to show you two more verses, and then I'll close. Are you still in 2 Peter 1? Look at verse 4. 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It's a long sentence. Let's go back through it backwards piece by piece. So the world, is it getting better or worse when you look at that verse? Corruption. Corruption is getting worse. That's what that word means. It means deteriorating, which is even longer. So corruption, getting worse and worse. And why is the world getting worse in that verse? It's because of desires, right? The world is following its desires. Uh, you want it, take it. That philosophy leads downhill. And that's the philosophy you see it everywhere. Advertising is built on the principle of if you want it, get it. And where does that principle take you? Downhill. And is it possible to escape that downhill trip according to the verse? You can, but the verse says only by having supernatural power inside of you. No supernatural power. Uh, I say to many Adventists, you don't have supernatural power. And consequently, you can't escape. How do you get supernatural power inside of you? That's by the promises. You take a promise... And this was how I was converted when I was 11. It was a man put in charge of my Sabbath school class that came in and he talked about the Bible promises like, like God was speaking, like you could really put your weight on it. And he knew that those promises would be fulfilled. He would talk that way and act that way. And God did do amazing things for Les Graham because of that. Amazing things. Gave him a wife when there wasn't anyone, anyone available. You can ask about that sometime later. So I was impressed with the word of God, and I still am. It's as you use the promises that you get supernatural power inside of you, then you can escape the desires that are making you go downhill. Last passage, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 4. This little baby paid better attention to the children's story than almost anyone else that was sitting here. <laughs> better. I was, I was watching. Are you there? 2 Corinthians 10, 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but they are powerful through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down what? Oh, that's a bad place to, to pause because it depends on which version you have. The King James says imagination. New King James says arguments. I'll tell you, the Greek word can mean either one, but in the context, it's very clear to me that the King James translators got it right. Let's just read on and you'll see it. Casting down imaginations... And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every what? Thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, there are many people whose imaginations are diseased. They just wander and they move around and they go to fantasy, to castle building, to wondering, to doubting. Their imaginations are just on the loose. It's almost like, like a car that is in gear and the accelerator is stuck and there's no one at the steering wheel. It's just a mess. And what God has said is that he is providing weapons that allow you to get a grip on your mind and to put your thoughts back under control 
and to place them on wholesome objects and to keep them on wholesome objects. And as you put your thoughts there, what a wonderful thing it is. So what I've said today is that mental health is a spiritual business. There are many things you can do that will destroy your mental health that have nothing to do with sin. But there are many things you can do with your thoughts that will lead to healing from mental issues if they haven't gone to the hopeless state. And I don't mean that every mental issue is related to religious things. I had a friend who, when he was in the military, was running with a pack on his back, full bore, had his head down, 40-pound pack, and he ran right into the gun of a helicopter gunship, and it hit him right in the forehead, full bore running. So he has some serious brain damage to the part of his brain that helps him overcome temptation. I pity that particular injury. It's a sad event that happened there. But that's not many of us. For many of us, what's happened to our frontal lobe is we've let our imagination go when we needed to keep it under control. We've thought about things that were dirty and violent and uh, selfish or materialistic when we needed to be thinking about someone that was pure and holy and sweet and true. And if we used our imagination properly, we would develop a health that would be enviable in our mind, one that would lead us in the right way. And if you use Facebook, I think you can find someone like Musab if you look. For me, I think that for I try 100 people and I find two or three like him, and the two or three like him take about a year, some of them, before anything works out useful. But I tell you, it's worth the work. And Jesus already jumped over the dogs. And it's just a bad time to stay up there doing nothing. I think you understand. Let's turn to our closing hymn, hymn number 608. And I hope someone will come up here and lead it besides me.
Our Father in heaven, I'm asking that you would finish the work you've started here, that you would use the love that you showed to us on Calvary to move us, that you'd find a way to wave a flag and get our attention and to help us to get a grip on those thoughts, to bring every thought under control. I ask for this gift and for your spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen.